Well, it's 10 o'clock, so why don't we get started? Okay. Well, uh, my name is David Butts. Uh, I'm a design engineer. I'm pretty old, so I'm retired or semi-retired. I still do some consulting and designing um, products and equipment and stuff. Uh, not in the nuclear field, which is something we're going to talk about today, but I've been thinking about what we need to do about energy production since I was about your age, maybe a little older. I was probably 16 when I really started to think about it, and I've been studying it a lot, and I want to share some of the results of that study with you, and I got to tell you, I'm really happy to share this with young folks like yourselves because it's going to be a few short years when this is going to be your responsibility. So it's something you need to learn about. And why don't we dive into it? I'll share my screen. And let's see if I get it here. Are you seeing it? Yes. Okay, I'll go into slideshow. Hang on here. Slideshow from the beginning. Okay, are we in good shape? Yes. Excellent. I need to reduce myself on the screen here a little bit. There we go. Okay. So here we are on our precious planet living in this paper thin atmosphere. And in that paper thin atmosphere, we enjoy the benefits of modern technology, which gives us the ability to travel. It gives us light and all kinds of comfort and all kinds of convenience, modern medicine, all the things that we enjoy in advanced societies. But we pay a high price for that energy by burning a lot of fossil fuel, now producing over 30 billion tons of CO2 per year. Some say it's as high as 40 already. And people are worried about putting that much CO2 into the atmosphere. To many, this is just plain pollution. Uh, I won't argue the, si the case today. Uh, some people disagree about how serious this is, but burning as much fossil fuel as we burn, and it's going to get larger in the future, may very well lead to climate change. It'll certainly lead to some global warming. Uh, ocean acidification, which can affect uh, our food chain, and things that we don't even know about. So what are we going to do about that? Well, a couple of things are on the table. All of you, I'm sure, have heard about renewables as an answer to this problem, that we can put up a lot of wind turbines, a lot of solar panels, and this will solve the problem. Others are considering nuclear energy as part of the solution, uh, and many people oppose that. Another pos reasonable position is let's use everything that we can. Uh, by the way, what we're calling renewables today is, as I said, wind and solar. Technically speaking, wind and solar are not renewables. A crop is renewable, but everybody calls wind and solar <laughs> renewables. So that's what we'll call them too. Renewables are green. when, As they harvest energy from the atmosphere, they don't put out any CO2. And they have wonderful special applications. Here's a wonderful special application for solar. Here, a small solar panel has brought irrigation to a small farm in a third world country for the first time. Before they had those solar panels, they had to carry the water some distance on their heads. Uh, many of you either live in homes or have neighbors who have solar panels on the roof that are supplying a lot of your family electricity, maybe some of your heating, maybe charging your electric car. Wind has been used for centuries to grind grain into flour and to take dry land and turn it into fer fertile, productive agricultural land. And today we have large solar uh, fields and large turbine farms that are beginning to contribute electricity to our power grids. But renewables have some big problems. The first big problem is material requirement. And if you look at this graph, you can see that the requirements for solar photovoltaic in terms of how much energy is produced are very large for steel and cement and glass and other things. Hydroelectric dams, of course, take a lot of cement. Wind turbines take a lot of cement and steel. And notice that nuclear uh, requires very small amount of material to provide the same amount of energy. 
As an example of the material used, here you see the beginning of the foundation for a wind turbine. Notice that there's a very deep excavation. We've laid down a little cement pad here, and now we have tons of steel rebar and tons more concrete is going to be poured in there to make sure that this doesn't happen. <laughs> a lot of material. Then there's another problem. Those wind turbine blades don't last very long. Um, and they, you have to do something with them at, at the end of their life. People are trying to learn how to recycle them, but it's not easy because they're fiber, fiberglass filled resins that don't, you can't just melt down like other recyclables. So you see what's being done here. These large hollow wind turbine blades have been cut into three pieces and they're being buried by, you see the size of the bulldozer there. They're being put into a landfill. Similar problems apply to SOAR. And this is what happened in Puerto Rico after uh, Hurricane Maria went through in 2017. This is a small part of the solar farm. And now in the soil, you have broken glass, silicon, uh, heavy metals like lead and cadmium mixed in with the soil. And even if the hurricane doesn't hit your solar farm, in a very short period of time, 20 years or less, you're going to have to recycle all of that material. And we also don't have ways of doing that effectively yet. Most of this material is now going into landfills. Another big problem for wind and solar is the demands on land. You can see this little green square down here. It says nuclear one square mile. Well, that's true for any fueled plant. If it's coal, oil, gas, or nuclear, you can have a very compact plant producing a lot of energy. Here I'm talking about a gigawatt average, that's a billion watts, uh, on a small piece of land. But because they are harvesting a very weak stream of energy from the sun and the wind, you need a lot more land to harvest the same amount of energy from solar and wind. Up to 75 square miles from solar, and you'd have to be at the right latitude to do that, and almost 400 square miles sometimes from wind turbines. That's a lot of land and that starts affecting the environment. People are cutting down forests to do solar and wind these days. There's another problem with wind and solar, which is that they are not steady. They vary a lot when the sun goes behind the cloud and the wind clouds and the wind dies down. Here's an example of the effect from Germany. They installed a lot of wind and solar. They still are. And you see a graph here, and this red line on the top shows the installed capacity. What that means is that if you had a wind turbine that was rated at four megawatts, and you had the wind blowing at exactly the right speed all the time, you'd get four megawatts. But the wind doesn't blow all the time, and it doesn't blow at the right speed all the time. And so what you actually get out of the wind turbines is this dark blue spiky stuff. And that spikiness is a real problem for the, the engineers who have to run the electrical grid because they have, to, they have to back it up with something else. And in Germany, what they have to back that up with is coal. Here in the United States, what we back up most of our wind and solar with is natural gas. So if your object is to eliminate the burning of fossil fuels, you haven't quite succeeded with wind and solar because that's what we, we use fossil fuels to back them up. Now that's a pretty quick tour through renewables because I wanna spend a little more time talking about nuclear, which may not be as familiar to you, but in summary, we can say that wind and solar can contribute to our future energy needs, but it's very hard for them to do everything because of the big problems that they have in meeting our real needs for constant dependable power. So I'm gonna move on to nuclear now. Nuclear has an enormous potential due to something we call energy density. And energy density is illustrated here. That's small little fuel pellet that, that's just made out of plastic. I made that in my shop, but a real fuel pellet that size of uranium oxide will deliver as much energy as a ton of coal. You may say, really? How can that be? Well, let's talk about it, but 
in order to talk about it, let's start talking about atoms. I'm sure most of you know what atoms are or something about atoms, but let's look at it. I know more. a lot about atoms. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. So you'll notice I call this a cartoon model. I'll come back to that because uh, we can't see atoms even with our best microscopes. Um, but if you could see them, they wouldn't actually look like this picture. But the picture does show you what's going on in an atom, namely electrons with a negative charge moving around a nucleus that had, has protons with a positive charge and some neutrons that have no charge. And you notice that there's the same number of electrons as protons. So the negative charges and the positive charges balance and your atom is neutral. It doesn't have a charge as a whole. Now, the number of neutrons uh, may vary. And in this particular case, we see four neutrons in there with the three neutrons. Now, because there's three electrons and, and three protons, this would be atom number three, element number three. This would be lithium. Now, let's talk about what's in that nucleus for a minute. And I'll remind you of something that probably all of you already know. Opposite charges attract, like charges repel. You know this if you take two magnets and you try to push their two north poles together, they, they'll resist like crazy. But if you turn one magnet around, they'll snap together because the north and the south will attract. So that's true of protons and electrons. So if you get a proton and electron, they'll go towards each other, but two protons will repel, two electrons will repel. All of this is why a battery works because the chemistry inside a battery pushes a lot of electrons up to the negative terminal. And the positive charge over here is an attraction for those uh, electrons as, and they're being repelled by other electrons here. So they go screaming down the wire through the filament and create light. Well, why did I bring that up? Well, it's very relevant to how the nucleus of an atom works. So here are examples of several different atoms from the different elements that are in the universe. Hydrogen is the simplest element and it's the most abundant element in the universe. And in regular hydrogen, there's, there's something called deuterium, uh, heavy hydrogen, that's fairly rare. But in regular hydrogen, there is one positive proton in the nucleus and one negative electron moving around it. And that's what our sun is made of mostly. But the energy that we get from the sun is part of a process that's turning some of that hydrogen into helium by smashing these atoms together. Well, as larger elements are made in the universe, we can move up the chain of elements. And here I stop at carbon for a minute. Carbon is element number six. So it has six electrons and six protons. You see positive charges there. And in this case, we've got six neutrons, the same number of neutrons as protons. But let's take a big jump and we'll move up to element number 79, which is gold. Now, because it's element number 79, you've got 79 electrons, little green things, and 79 protons. But notice that the number of neutrons has gotten quite a bit bigger. Why is that happening? It's because like charges repel. And in order to have a nucleus that big with 79 protons in there, and they're all trying to push each other apart, you've got to start <laughs> adding more neutrons. The neutrons are the magic ingredient to hold the nucleus together. What happens is that the neutrons and the protons, which are about, about the same size, almost exactly the same size, can attract each other by something called the strong force. It's kind of a mysterious force that scientists didn't even know about until the 20th century. It's not like gravity or electrostatic force that goes out into space. It only happens at a very short distance when the when the neutrons and the protons get really close together, then they, they pair up and they bond together with a strong force. Now let's move all the way up to uranium, which is what we're gonna talk about today for nuclear energy. This is the heaviest atom in nature, heaviest element, 92 electrons, 92 protons. But look at this, this number, first of all, there's a range of numbers, but this number is getting really big. Now we have more than one and a half times as many neutrons as protons gluing this thing together. That's and a lot fact, of energy. And the fact that there is a range here is because, 
we can have different numbers of neutrons in different uranium atoms. So those different versions of uranium are called isotopes. All of them will act the same chemically. That's where the electrons interact with each other. But in terms of nuclear energy, uh, they are different. You see the little jack box up, the jack in the box up there? Well, that represents what's really happening in this nucleus. We now have 92 positively charged protons all pushing against each other. And you can imagine that they've all, they're all on a, on a little uh, pogo stick. They've all got springs pushing against each other. So that means if we tickle that thing in the right way, it's going to split apart. That's how nuclear energy works. Here are two versions of uranium, two uranium isotopes, U-235 and U-238. And we come up with these numbers by just adding the protons to the neutrons. So U-235 has 143 neutrons, U-238 has 146. And this, all of this is important because when we dig uranium out of the ground, the proportion is not equal. In fact, this U-235 is less than 1%. It's less than one hundredth of the uranium that comes out of the ground. But the U-235 is what we want for our nuclear power plants. So this creates a big, a big technical issue for how do we separate out and, and enrich the uranium. I won't talk about that process today. That's pretty involved. But it's something to be aware of that you have different isotopes of elements. And we're looking for U-235 for nuclear energy. Uh, a quick review of something you've seen in different forms before, the periodic table. This shows us all, all of our elements, starting with hydrogen, number one, then we go to helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon. There's number six we talked about. Here's gold, 79. The heaviest one in nature, as I said, is uranium, number 92. But now that we have nuclear science, we have been able to create a whole slew of more elements. And... The first nine or 10, 10 of them actually are elements that we can use. In fact, your smoke detector has a little of this in it, americium. Most of these up here, however, are only created in big machines called atom smashers. And we've never created enough of these elements to even see them. In some cases, we've only created three or four atoms. Notice that I've labeled lead the heaviest stable element. So between number 82 and 92, every element is unstable. What that means is there's so many protons in there pushing things apart that eventually something is going to radiate away from that. It may take, in many cases, it takes billions of years for that to happen, but they will send out a little alpha particle, which is two protons and two neutrons, or an electron or a gamma ray, which is like a really high powered X-ray. So all of these heavier elements are unstable. But we take advantage of that with uranium to do uh, nuclear fission. Now, I'm going to say one more thing about atoms because I mentioned that this is a cartoon. If, if we really could zoom in on it and see it, it would not look at, at all like this. So I want to share with you a little bit of reality so that you can wrap your heads around what we're really dealing with. How little is the nucleus? If the nucleus of a hydrogen atom were the size of a BB, one eighth inch in diameter, how big could the atom be? Are you ready? As big as a baseball park. So if that were a hydrogen atom, its electron would be running around out here and its proton would be a BB down there in the middle. It's pretty amazing. And physicists didn't understand this uh, until a little bit after the beginning of understanding that there were atoms and there were electrons and there were neutrons, well, that there were protons. It took them a while to figure this out. So let's talk a little bit about that science that led us to understand nuclear energy eventually, uh, nuclear physics. Here are a couple of the pioneers. I could show you dozens of people, but these are a couple of very important pioneers in, in development of nuclear science. Most of you have probably heard of Marie Curie called Madame Curie. She was actually born Manya Sklodowska. She was Polish by birth, but moved to France. Uh, oh yeah, Mary Curie's. Madame Curie, Curie. she uh, coined the term radioactivity. What she and other scientists were discovering around 1900 is that those heavier elements were giving off energy. It was 
an absolutely amazing discover when it, discovery when it was first discovered. Nobody even imagined that this could be the case. And by the way, Ma uh, Marie Curie is the only person ever to win two Nobel Prizes. She won the Physics Nobel Prize, and later she won the Chemistry Nobel Prize. Also, wasn't she the first woman to win a Nobel? Yeah, can, uh, yeah, we can talk about some more detail when I get to questions. I'm going to leave plenty of, of time. She was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. And uh, since you mentioned that, 40 years later, Lise Meitner was working in Germany. And by this time, people had figured out that there was something called a neutron, which they didn't figure out till 1932. And they were firing neutrons at atoms of every kind, carbon and gold and everything, all the way up to uranium. And in the laboratory where Lise Meitner was working, suddenly they had a result that they didn't understand. Instead of getting a more massive atom, they suddenly had two little atoms and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And Lee's Meitner figured out what was going on. The atom had split into two pieces. They, she had coined the term nuclear fission. Now, speaking of Nobel prizes, more than 50 of her colleagues in, in the physics world, mostly men, nominated her again and again and again for both the physics and chemistry Nobel Prize. And she never did get it, which is kind of a, an injustice of history. Uh, the next woman to win it was Maria Geppert Mayer, the physics Nobel. Uh, she did something really remarkable in nuclear physics. She discovered magic numbers, but I'll talk about that some other day. <laughs> so what's nuclear fission? So what, what did Lise Meitner figure out? Well, they're firing a neutron at a U uranium-235 nucleus. Remember, it's got uh, 92 protons, but it's also got 143 neutrons. But they fire it in, it gets absorbed, and it creates a really unstable situation. You have tickled the jack-in-the-box. And <laughs> very quickly, that thing blows apart into two pieces. And this is what the mystery was at first. It created two smaller elements. It created a, a atom of krypton and an atom of barium. Now it doesn't always split into those two. It can split into different combinations, but it always splits into two. And it also always gives out two or three extra neutrons. That's very important to nuclear energy because the nuclear process wouldn't work without those extra neutrons because these neutrons go on and hit another U-235 to give you what you call a chain reaction. Well, what do we get out of this? We get heat. What happens is that these particles and these neutrons are flying apart at tremendous speed, up to a tenth of the speed of light. I mean, really, really, really fast. Well, what does speed mean in little particles? It means heat. And you can see this when you boil water on the stove. Just before it starts to boil, you'll see a lot of motion on the surface of the water. And that's because all of the water molecules are moving faster and faster and faster, and they're making things bounce around, including the dust on the surface of the water. So what we're doing is taking all that kinetic energy, so-called, from the speed of these particles and eventually harvesting the heat, just like we do with coal, oil, and gas, to create electricity. Well, who's this guy? I think most of you know. He's Albert, Albert Einstein. Einstein. Albert Einstein. Right, Albert, Albert Einstein. Einstein. And there's his fa famous formula, E equals mc squared. And then what, E equals mass times speed of light. Yeah. I so what? And then E equals mass for every square to speed of light. Actually, I have that memorized. Yeah, well, good. I'm glad you do. So what he understood, which nobody had understood before, is that energy and matter were two forms of the same thing. They could be converted back and forth. And yes, as you say, you take a little bit of matter and you multiply it by the square of the speed of light. The speed of light multiplied by itself. The speed of light, we sometimes say it's 186,000 miles per second, but it's in the metric system, it's 100 million meters per second. And if you square that, you get 90 quadrillion meters squared per second squared. That is a big number. So <laughs> a t when this happened, when the fission happened, if you weighed the fission products and the neutrons that came out, they would be slightly lighter than the original uranium nucleus. Some of that original 
massed in the uranium nucleus was converted into the energy that we're seeing, but it's a lot. That's why that little pellet is equal to a ton of coal. Well, mm. how do we use that little pellet? Um, what we do is we stuff a whole bunch of them into these zirconium tubes, we bundle the tubes together and we hang them in water in a reactor. And we pump the water past these tubes and all of that heat from all of this fission is transferred to the water and we move that water to create useful energy. Now in a conventional reactor, which is what's mostly in the world today, there's about 440 reactors in the world, a little under hundred in our country, you have all those little fuel assemblies inside the reactor shell. This is an extremely thick, very strong steel container. And you have a pressurized pressurizer pushing water around in a circle. And that water gets very hot. You run it through a heat exchanger, then it gets turned to steam. You run a turbine, which is connected to a generator and you get electricity. But, a lot of people are not happy about nuclear energy. Some folks say no nukes and they have opposition and fear. And the biggest question I get- Because they associate the word nuclear with bombs. Yeah, well, that's one reason. What's nukes? The, com the commonest question I get is what about radioactive waste? Well, let's talk about radioactive waste. In the first place, it's not really waste. You see in red here, I'm calling it partially spent fuel. The reason we call it that is we have to take this thing out of the reactor for technical reasons after about three to five years before we've actually gotten all of the energy that the uranium could give us. So in some countries like France, they actually take those tubes, they chop them up and they recycle them and they put the, they put the material back into a reactor and get more energy. For partially political reasons in this country, we don't do that today. We could in the future. But here I say something else. Waste is an argument for nuclear. What do I mean by that? Well, nuclear energy production is the only technology for producing energy from heat that contains everything that it makes. It doesn't put any CO2 into the atmosphere. And all of that material that comes out is safely contained. Uh, here you see it contained in what are called uh, dry cask storage. Ca uh, these are called dry casks. This is dry cask storage. You can see they're perfectly safe. You can walk right up to them uh, with no harm. Um, and the walls of these things are about two feet thick of concrete and steel, which completely protects you from any radiation that's in there. Now, talking about radiation, which is what people fear, when we pull these things out of the reactor, we have to do it with remote, remote handling, because if you got near, near this, it would be very dangerous. The reason for that is that all of those little fission products, the little atoms that were created, they have too many neutrons in their nucleus. They're on, they are also unstable. They want to radiate away that instability. So for a while, for a while they're radioactively hot. So we take those things and we put them in the bottom of a 30 foot swimming, 30 foot deep swimming pool to cool down for five years. Then we put them in these casks. Uh, this is really very safe. We may end up burying these deep in geology, but they're pretty safe the way they are. These will last for a hundred years and we could reprocess this fuel and even get worthwhile materials out of it. Now, some people are afraid of these things. They think, oh, somebody's going to shoot a bazooka at it or something. Well, that's been tested. Here is a rocket on a rocket sled running into one of these things at 600 miles per hour. The rocket liquefies and the cast <laughs> survives. They've run into these things with locomotives. They've dropped them from height and burned them in fuel oil fires, and they survive. We actually know how to deal with what is called nuclear waste, and, and it's all very safe. And on top of all that, all of the nuclear, so-called nuclear waste that we've created in 60 years in this country, supplying a fifth of our electricity, could be stored in a Walmart. There's not very much of it. Okay, let's talk about a modern large-scale nuclear plant. Uh, 
these there's two of these uh, just being built in Georgia. One of them is already online, and the next the second one will be online by the end of the year. Uh, we've developed through generations of technology in 60 years. This is generation three plus, which means it has passive safety. And that represents this water tank on the top so that water could drain down from the top and cool it without any kind of pumps or valves. Um, so you wouldn't have any kind of an accident like the one that happened in Japan and Fukushima in 2011. These things or are very- Chernobyl. Yeah, Chernobyl's in a whole different story. Um, which I can talk about if you if you want to afterwards. Uh, that's that's an entirely different kind of reaction. So I think I uh, up, um, CNN on Geno um, on Genova. Okay, can can we do our discussion in just a couple minutes? I'll just finish this power plant slide, and then I want want to hear t uh, your questions and discussion. Uh, okay, so th this is a big plant, uh, and they they operate very safely. They really do, but. What's really exciting, and it can be exciting for young people like you, because you, if you are interested in this field, there's some really nifty stuff coming down the line. There's new science and new nuclear. There are different fuels being considered, including even the element thorium, uh, but different. there's something called triso fuel, and there are different alloys, all kinds of different things. And something I wanna emphasize is different coolants. Some of these have been tried already, but most of the reactors today use water as we've already described. Water is running by those fuel rods getting the heat. But you can also use molten metal like sodium or lead. You can use molten salt and you can use gases like carbon dioxide or helium. In fact, if you, you use helium, you can get the highest temperatures of all. You can get such high temperatures that you can now maybe uh, get hydrogen from water and create synthetic fuels and do a lot of other exciting things. And finally, we're making them more compact. You'll hear this term SMRs. That means small modular reactors. There's over 80 designs being developed around the world. And the idea behind the small modular reactors is that you will now have something really compact. This is also a cartoon, of course, but compared to the car, this is a regular nuclear plant. It takes years to build one on site with a lot of cranes and construction and so forth. But the idea of the small modular reactor is you build it in a factory, just like building a big air, airplane, and you put it on a truck or a boat, and you take it to where it's needed, and you hook it up, and away you go. Here's one example of that. A U.S. company, company Thorcon, they're working on doing this in Indonesia. They would build power plants uh, in, on a barge in a shipyard, and then moor them in an appropriate place, and service them with this thing called a can ship. And they bring in a little reactor that's dropped into a little silo. And that reactor will supply energy for four years without doing anything. And then it needs to be refueled. And you swap over to the one over here, let this cool down, and you uh, take this back for reprocessing. Now, after the bomb, which somebody mentioned, which was the unfortunate first use of nuclear energy, we turned to making power. The first nuclear power went to sea. USS Nautilus submarine in 1954. And we now have a lot of submarines and aircraft carriers powered by nuclear reactors. The Russians are very big in this Let me field. See this. Yeah. Here they, they, this is a right. float, floating power plant. And this has been connected up in Siberia in the north of Russia. This has been con connected to, it's in, in a, behind a breakwater, connected to a small town called Pevek. And it supplies them all their electricity and all of their heat. And it's very safe. They also have a big fleet. Well, a big fleet. They have several icebreakers. These have twin reactors on board. And these can cut through 10 feet of ice. And they have a nuclear freighter as well. We are working on things here in North America. And I'll quickly just highlight a couple of them. Down here at the Blue Star are those um, plants that I just mentioned. The uh, the big Vodal reactors, um, which are regular water-cooled reactors. But where the, you see the red stars are some of the new experimental reactors that are going to uh, be tried out for the first time within the next decade or so. Down here in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where a lot of nuclear development happened way back in the 40s, uh, for example, there will be a reactor uh, that is cooled by salt, molten salt. Up here in Kemmerer, Wyoming, we'll have a reactor 
cooled by a molten sodium. And this reactor will replace a retiring coal plant, which is a really exciting opportunity. So when a coal plant is so old that it needs to be retired, that's a good place to put a new nuclear plant because all the electric lines are already there. Up here at our Idaho National Laboratory, where a lot of reactors have been developed in the last 60 years, there's three different reactors that are going to be developed. Another one cooled by salt, another one cooled with uh, heat pipes, and one that's cooled by water. And this one up here in Washington will be cooled by helium. And this one in Canada is a so-called boiling water reactor, but a smaller boiling water reactor. So that's a quick tour of nuclear. There's much more you can learn. I say no math or physics required, but uh, you folks are smart and you probably would like the math and physics too, but there's lots of books and things that you can learn from and I'm happy to share more information. You can contact me, uh, some of my friends and I have a little website you can look at, Eco-Nuclear Solutions for uh, more information. I'll also tell you that I saw the premiere Monday night, two nights ago of uh, this new movie, Nuclear Now, you might find that worth watching as well. So I want to open things up to questions now and discussion. And just before I do that, I want to just say a couple of things. <clears throat> uh, first of all, when you woke up this morning, maybe you thought that renewables were the answer to everything. And maybe you thought that nuclear was a terrible thing that we should never do. No, you, I already, I already. You, knew I, that say, be, I really, I just think. That okay, nobody called on any. Hold it, hold it. Let, yeah, yeah. Let me just, just finish for a moment. If you felt that way, you would not be alone because many people feel that way. So why should you believe me? Well, you don't even know me. Actually, you shouldn't, without doing your own research. I can look you in the eye and tell you that what I've shared with you is the result of a lot of honest research. But you smart young folks have to do your own research. You have to dig and you have to be careful not to just listen to all the noise that you hear around you because there's a lot of people screaming about this on the media every day. But being smart is not the same thing as knowing what is true. You have to do the work. So Yeah, I know. That's one thing, and I'll just say one other thing. For young folks like you who are hearing all the noise about climate change and how dangerous it is and how everything is going to go crazy and if we don't do something quick, many of you, this is a source of a lot of fear. That's very natural. Back up a little bit from that fear. There is a difference between urgency and panic. It's important to face these realities with a sense of urgency. But if we panic, if we react with fear, it's very likely we'll do the wrong thing and delay the right answers. So that's enough from me. Do anybody have, does anybody have a question? Let me take the questions, please. Okay. We'll do them. All right. All right. Uh, we're sure. gonna do them according to hands that are raised and I'll try and get you all in as much as possible. So okay. Simeon, I'll see you in the first Okay, um, how are like nuclear meltdowns even caused? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question exactly? How are nuclear meltdowns caused in like power plants? Okay, well, first of all, they are very rare. So uh, I'll talk about, there's been three in almost 70 years. Uh, and you probably know about all of them. Uh, Three Mile Island was the first one that happened here in Pennsylvania. Then we had Chernobyl, which one of you mentioned, and then we had Fukushima in Japan. Three Mile Island was basically operator error and plant design. The operators weren't well trained. There were too many dials and bells and whistles in the control room, and they didn't understand what was actually going on. Uh, and they they went the wrong way about the water supply. So it was actually human error and bad training. And it is said that if they locked the doors to the control room, the automatic system would systems would have avoided that accident. As a result of examining that accident in detail, everything changed. And now the operators have to be thoroughly trained and, and the operating rooms make sense and they know what's going on at all times. That kind of accident will never happen again. Chernobyl 
is the only one of the three accidents that actually harmed and killed people from radiation. And that happened because you had a very poorly designed reactor that was partly meant for making nuclear weapons material being recklessly run and it had no containment structure. So they had not, no way of containing the radioactive material that was emitted afterwards. And it was a pretty complicated case. It was actually, a, a, if you can believe it, a safety test. They were deliberately turning the power way down to see if the inertia in the, in the generators would keep emergency power going. And they went too low and, and some bad situations happened within the, the water supply and the moderator within that reactor. It gets into pretty complicated physics. But these meltdowns are very uncommon. Now, in fact, the, in the case of Fukushima, you had a perfectly well-designed um, plant, but the engineering was ridiculous with respect to the emergency water supply because you had these pumps and generators and fuel down below where they could be flooded in a tsunami. So that's what caused that plant. But even in that case where some radioactivity was released, it really is not at a level where it will cause radioactive harm. Azalea? So you talked about the disadvantages of solar and wind, but mm -hmm. are there any major disadvantages for nuclear? And if there aren't any major ones, why don't people see nuclear energy as an option for the future? That's a good question. Uh, very well put. Yeah, very well stated. Uh, anything has its advantages and disadvantages if you look at uh, look under the covers. Um, well, the biggest issue with nuclear, of course, is dealing with radioactivity. You have to design things in such a way that you don't expose people, the operators or the public to the radioactivity. But I will say that that's not, in terms of engineering, a very big downside because we know how to do this. We've really learned a tremendous amount. And some of these future things that I mentioned briefly are gonna be even safer. For example, a molten salt reactor can't melt down. It actually operates in a melting state. And if you had a leak, the material would solidify. It wouldn't go into the atmosphere, it would actually freeze. So th that's the first part of your question. That's the, the thing that you have to deal with with nuclear is radioactivity. Why aren't we doing it? Well, there's a lot of reasons. One of them I've already addressed, fear. There's a lot of public fear of nuclear. And that is partly because we conflate it with nuclear weapons, partly because we don't really understand what it is. And that has a secondary issue associated with it, which is that fear is embedded into our regulatory bodies. In this country, we have the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they stand in the way of quickly adopting new nuclear. So there's a lot of issues between now and when we can get some of these things online. Danny? Yeah, what I think they should do, this is a little question more of opinion, what I think they should do, they should put this stuff, build this stuff as far away from like society as possible so that if there's a meltdown, nothing bad happens. But like they should also have like offsite operation, like back here in America, and probably in these like maintenance drones and stuff so that nobody actually has to go there and potentially die. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that is cer also, certainly feel better because it's far away, and if it explodes, there's like, oh, nothing's going to happen to us. It's well, it's certainly something to consider. People have considered that, including floating plants that are offshore. Uh, let Let me immediately pick up on that last word that I heard from you, which is explode. These things never explode. I mean, I, oh. there was an explode. There have been explosions at Chernobyl, for instance, but it was not actually a nuclear explosion. There were two explosions at Chernobyl. There was a steam explosion and a hydrogen explosion. And the reason I'm raising that is that a lot of people think that a nuclear plant is, is a potential nuclear bomb. It, it isn't. It can't be. It's physically impossible because the enrichment of the uranium is so low. It's down around five percent, and you need ninety for a the bomb. Um, but in answer to your question about putting them far away, they really are very safe when well designed. And when you take them far away, then you have the added cost of the power lines to get the power where you need. I know, it's, but like the value of a human life is worth more than. 
Well, yeah. Yes, but, but when the, you talk, statistically, yeah. it almost never happens. Okay, yeah, that's, please don't interrupt. Yeah, that's that's yeah, true. No, but I still, but I want to still want to play Russian roulette with a one million round barrel because it's not a common thing. It's quite rare to have. Well, well, in fact, that's where we have to get into the choices that we make, the difficult choices we make in life, and. I'll bring up a couple of examples. We get into automobiles every day, and that activity is way more dangerous than having a nuclear power plant near you. We get into airplanes, that's more dangerous. And we have big airplane crashes, but we have them less often because we've learned how to deal with the issues that, that were there in the early part of the aviation, early development of aviation. But we make those choices. We do subject ourselves to some danger in order to get some advantages. They're difficult choices. There's no question about it. Yeah. We do and only wait, have, logistically, we, hold it's on, really, please, Atlas. Hang on, just please. We're technically over, but we have 15 minutes before our next thing. If you would like to stay and ask questions, please do so. But if you need the break, you can also do that. Ray, what's your question? Actually, I have a bunch. Um, who well, get one. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question. Could we technically, um, using nuclear power, um, start? Um, could we technically use? Um, hmm. Is our if we use all renewables together, um along with nuclear power, do you think that would work? Because we could use nuclear power to supercharge um, aqua electric energy, I think. Right? I, I, I didn't hear that last part, but, but could we use them together? Definitely. Um, yeah. That was sort of what I tried to say on that earlier slide where some people are saying renewables, some people are saying nuclear, and a lot of people say, let's use everything we can. If we need to do something about fossil fuels, let's use everything we can. Yes, we can use them together. I feel like technically, um, wouldn't we use nuclear energy to like spin like big fans and like push the water forward to help um and just to um to increase hydroelectric um, energy on days when the water's calm? Well, that's a creative and interesting idea, but, but let me tell you something about designs like that. Every time you convert energy from one form to another, you always lose energy. It's unavoidable. It's one of the laws of thermodynamics. So if you try to take one form of energy and then turn it into another, bottom line, you're probably gonna lose out. It's probably better to take that heat and use it as quickly as you can, rather than trying to do something else to it before you get something else out of it. So that that would be the only problem with that idea. But it's a very creative idea. Uh, isn't isn't okay, energy hold on. Okay, Ray, I can only take one per person because I've got like 20 people here. Uh, Atlas. Um, could you just um, try to briefly explain like the difference between nuclear fission and nuclear fusion? Sure. Uh, it's actually easy to do quickly. Nuclear fission, we we take a big atom of uranium. You actually can, in modern reactors, you can also use plutonium and you can turn thorium into uranium, but you take a big atom and you split it into two pieces and you get a lot of heat. Nuclear fusion, you take two very tiny atoms, uh, you could take two hydrogen atoms um, and you smash them together into a helium atom and you get energy out of that too. But that is incredibly hard to do because of what we talked about with like charges repelling. To force two nuclei together, two hydrogen nuclei together uh, with their, they want, to, they want to do nothing like pulling together. They want to push each other apart. It's very hard to do. So they, they use these, they're experimenting with plasmas and so forth. But that's the difference. Either taking two light atoms and smashing them together or taking one big atom and splitting it apart. Okay, if, thank if, you. If, uh, if, Noah? Like, yeah, go ahead. Noah? What was it like to work for a nuclear 
or for a nuclear power plant? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, it's actually- How long does it like to study atoms? Well, both of those things are, are good things. Um, actually, when they do studies of, of public approval of nuclear, in communities around nuclear plants, the public approval is very high because the jobs are, are good paying, good jobs, and they supply economic an economic engine to the community. And nuclear physics is a very exciting field. So studying atoms is a terrific thing to do. <laughs> um, Jasper and Eliel. I just want to say thank you for, for teaching us all of this. Oh, well, thank you. That was, that was very generous of you. Thank you. Uh, Jude. Have any animals been affected in any way, shape or form by any, by nuclear? Um, well, generally, no, but I, the question is interesting to me because of the Chernobyl situation. Uh, people are very afraid still of the area around Chernobyl. Uh, you should know, however, after that accident, they continued to operate the other plants that were there. But today, because people are afraid of moving back there, it's gone back to wildlife. And that area is now teeming with animals. Um, there are wild horses and wild boars and deer and so forth that were basically not there before that accident. So, I mean, animals could be harmed in the same way that humans could be harmed. But in general, we have not had much radioactive harm from nuclear uh, power generation. Uh, of course, the bomb was terribly harmful. Uh, when, we, when we dropped bombs in Japan, that's the whole other story. But that's not nuclear energy. I mean, it's not productive nuclear energy, it's destructive nuclear energy. I think I'm gonna call on myself last. Yeah, sure. So um, I was one of those people, children, that um, walked in Saturday morning saying, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very pro solar. I've got solar panels all over my roof. I'm very pro wind. I actually know of a different design that's vertical that takes up much less space and lasts longer than wind power for wind power. But I realized that we need stuff that's not just going to do our house. Like all my solar panels take care of my house. But what about big factories and big cities? Is New York City, is every house going to have solar panels on top? And then in 20 years, what do we do with all that stuff? Yeah. So because this has now gotten down to a thing about that big is the main deal. And because it has become very, very safe and uh, Dr. Butts told me like, for example, in Pennsylvania at Three Mile Island, people were actually able to be very close to that and they did were not harmed. So yes, we did a horrible, horrible thing. My father actually was there after the bomb was dropped at Hiroshima. It was a horrible thing that human beings did out of ignorance but we're not ignorant anymore. So I hope that you wouldn't let one fearful example cause you to say, I'm never gonna use that tool. So if I use the candle and it catches fire to my bed and that catches fire to my house and burns down my house, am I never gonna use a candle again? good example. <laughs> and that's how I sort of think of this. And I see I have one more hand up. It is break time. Um, if you have more questions, please write them down and more comments and more statements to make. And we will definitely send them to Dr. Butts. It's a really quick thing. It's a really, really quick thing. Everybody's um, they, got a really, really quick thing, Ray. We really, really, really they, need to try to move on. There is actually one other okay. 
Everybody uh, else can leave. Power. Gray, you stay. There's actually one other kind of renewable power. Oh, there's a lot. Um, Dice, no, there is. What about a Dyson sphere? Well, it's technically not renewable, but it would last a very long time. What are well, you we're not saying to get rid of the renewables. What we're saying is no. Um, yes, the Dyson sphere is the most advanced form of solar energy. It's literally encompassing the sun in solar panels. That's a Dyson sphere. Yeah, that it would be a big with, job. Yeah, but it is possible if we become a little bit more advanced. Well, um, hopefully we'll become more a advanced. A little bit. You may these. not know how big the sun is. How many no, Earths I, can you actually, in the sun? We, um, actually, I do know how big it is. That but would take thousands of years. Know the possum. I also know that um that if we got that um and also um, if we block that, the sun, then how would we like get no we like, wouldn't block it. Oh, <laughs> it would we wouldn't block it. It would be a David. Remember what I told you on Saturday? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got a lot of creative minds going on here. Yeah, that that would be a pretty hard thing to do. Uh, I yeah, think, but the I, thing is, we aren't even a type one on the hero desk. Um, on the psycho dash scale and if we become a type one it would be possible right now we're, right. we're i think type 0 0.67 well let me just get just throw this out at you if you're going to put solar panels all around the sun you would need more material than the mass of the earth yeah that's true we would actually be um we just would most likely have to mine mercury it would be very, very. We have exactly three minutes left. Sume, your hand is up. I don't think you'd be able to put solar panels exactly on the sun. Because <laughs> yeah, you, it wouldn't. It would be like a few miles away, but you know. Yeah, because if you put it like on the a sun, few thousand since the sun is away. like, since the yeah, sun is yeah. like super hot, won't the solar panels just get burnt? Yeah, uh -oh. there, there would be a lot of technical details. And like melt think, away. I think that's a discussion for another day. And, you know, really, I mean, we have Dr. Butts's email. And if you want to say, you can videotape it, you can write it down, you can send it by carrier pigeon, we will get him your questions and your comments. And he will answer you. He's a really nice guy. <laughs> okay. I'll answer you and I'll come again and talk to you again next year if you want. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Okay, I'm not saying that we should get rid of renewables at all. I'm just saying that um, I'm now more open to this possibility because it seems like it's a whole lot safer than it used to be. Thank you very, very much. Can everybody uh, unmute and give a round of applause? <laughs> Let's hear it. Thank you. It was a delight to talk to you.